We gotta tell people that Liberty Mutual customizes car insurance, so you only pay for what you need. And we gotta do it fast. Ah! Woo! New personal record, Limu! Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. I brought in Ensure Max Protein with 30 grams of protein. Those who tried me felt more energy in just two weeks. Uh, Here, I'll take that. Ensure Max Protein with 30 grams of protein, one gram of sugar, and nutrients to support immune health. Everybody was keen as mustard to get going again. Tomorrow, we're with the amazing race host, Phil Kogan, breaking down the show's big pandemic changes. We had to get creative. It was like a, a big old mystery tour. Phil, I want to go on the show so bad. You? We. I want to be against you now. now. Happening now. Crimes up by a small percentage in San Antonio, but murders saw a huge jump. What the police chief had to say about the latest crime statistics. It's now a little easier to get an at-home COVID test. We'll tell you how you can place your order, how many free tests you can get, and when they would ship. One more warm day like today, then a strong cold front hits, and behind that cold front, the chance of a bit of a wintry mix. We're gonna talk about that in detail in just a bit. The News at Five starts right now. And first at five, we have breaking news out of Bastrop County. Firefighters are battling a 300 acre grass fire there. This is spreading quickly. Bastrop County right outside of Austin. And right now the fire is not at all contained. Yeah, around two this afternoon, Texas A&M Forest Service reported there were 150 acres burning. You can see by the plumes of smoke just how large that fire is now, about double in size. We know residents in the area have been evacuated. Now, these grass fires have been pretty common lately with high winds we have seen helping to fuel them and spread them even further. We're going to continue to monitor this fire and we'll keep you updated in our later newscasts as well as online at ksat.com. A new at five crime up last year in San Antonio, mostly driven by a bump in property crime. But the focal point of today's presentation of the 2021 crime stats to a council committee was a big jump in homicides. Our Garrett Berger tells us what the police chief had to say. Those are sobering statistics. The San Antonio Police Department's crime stats today showed a 2% overall bump last year compared to 2020, driven by a 4% increase in property crimes. Even though violent crimes fell 9% overall, the spike in homicides caught the eye. We had 160 murders last year as compared to 130 the previous year. A 23% jump over 2020 and the highest number of killings since 1994. Police Chief William McManus says for most of them, there's no apparent pattern. They seem to be random, spontaneous, all over the city. He also trotted out a common refrain that engaging in high-risk activities gives you a greater chance of becoming a victim of violence. Something District 3 Councilwoman Phyllis Villagran latched on to as a reason to resist a site release ordinance. Your risk, if you are involved in any sort of criminal element, even if it's just, but all I do is, you know, I just want a little bit of recreational drugs, it, you still put yourself at risk. The city already follows the site release policy for several low-level misdemeanors, including pot possession which McManus told us he's fine with, so long as officers have discretion whether to arrest. However, he also said he met with several other chiefs recently. They're seeing the results of the criminal justice reform of lowering bonds, and the results aren't good. It's clearly um, visible on the street that there's a, a, a no fear of consequence for committing a criminal act. And, I, and I'm talking about from drug dealing to, and you name it. The question that I will or that I ask myself is how many people do we have to arrest before crime goes down? Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And now to a defender's update. More than two years after 45-year-old Randall Goodale was shot, Randall Goodale Jr. was shot and killed by two members of law enforcement. His family is suing the city and both officers involved. In January of 2020, Goodale was fatally shot by a deputy U.S. Marshal and an SAPD officer who were trying to arrest him on a federal felony warrant for felon in possession of a handgun. Hours after the shooting, San Antonio Police Chief William McManus said the officers opened fire after Goodall started ramming into occupied police vehicles. A defender's investigation and this video later revealed that simply was not the case. 
The lawsuit blames the city for, quote, immediately adopting the officer's version of events in an attempt to justify its officer's use of deadly force to the public rather than determine the truth of what occurred, end quote, among other accusations. The family is seeking more than $75,000 for pain and suffering. It's asking for a jury to determine a proper amount above that. Both sides were back in court today in the capital murder case of R.C. Curtis. Back in November, a mistrial was declared in this case after the prosecution and the defense learned of additional evidence that was gathered and handed over by police after the trial was already underway. Today's status hearing was held virtually to let both sides know that transcripts from the trial were ready for both the defense and the state to pick up. The next hearing is set to take place February 1st. Curtis is accused of killing his wife's grandmother, Paula Boyd, back in 2015. Right now, he is out on bond. We're working to learn the name of a woman killed while walking along Highway 90 overnight. It happened about 3.30 this morning near Enrique Barrera Parkway. San Antonio police say the driver stayed at the scene and is not facing charges. A San Antonio firefighter recovering after he fell from a ladder while trying to fight flames at a Northwest Side restaurant. This happened at the Chester's Hamburgers along I-10. Crews say this all started as a grease fire. As one of the firefighters was going up to the roof, he fell from that ladder about 10 feet. He was taken to a hospital, but we're told he is okay. At last check, investigators were still assessing all the damage. Local COVID cases still climbing today. Metro Health reporting 5,413 new cases, seven new deaths. The seven day average moving to 6,140. There are 1,197 COVID positive patients in the hospital, 249 people in the intensive care, 105 people are on ventilators. If you need a COVID test, there is now another option for that. The city of San Antonio has now opened up its mass testing site at the Alamo Dome. It's through a partnership with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. That site will be open seven days a week from 7 in the morning till 5 p.m. through February 4th. Now, here's what the city wants you to know. Appointments are required. What has happened on the first day of opening, we found that several people, uh, they went online to uh, register for an appointment. However, they did not complete the entire form, so the system kicked them out. So please read the form entirely before you hit submit. Now these are PCR tests, so they will not give rapid results. Instead, you'll get your results back in 48 to 72 hours, depending on which day you test. Metro Health encourages anyone who is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 to go get tested. Again, appointments are required, and you can register at covid19.sanantonio.gov or call 311 and select option 8. Boy, those tests have been hard to come by. The Omicron's variant's ability to spread quickly, creating an extraordinary need for COVID-19 tests, leading to shortages, plenty of frustration. But today, the White House opened up an online portal to request rapid tests. Here's what you need to know. New COVID-19 cases still high, hospitals still struggling. And when it comes to COVID-19 tests, an unprecedented demand. That's why we've had to take additional measures. We have a billion tests that will become available to people that they can order through the website. That website, covidtests.gov, launched today. Initially, there will be a limit of four tests per household. They're expected to be shipped within seven to 12 days of being ordered. No shipping costs. Most Americans with private insurance can also now buy home tests online or in stores. Contact your insurer to find out if they provide direct coverage at the time of purchase or if claims must be submitted. Make sure to keep your receipt in case it's needed. Other things to know, you won't need a doctor's order or prescription to get the free tests. Insurers must pay for up to eight tests per covered person a month. As for any tests bought before January 15th, you won't be able to get reimbursed for those. If you're on Medicare, COVID-19 testing done in a lab when ordered by a medical professional comes at no charge. Those enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans should check with insurers to see if at-home test costs will be covered. Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, cover home tests with no cost sharing. But enrollees should contact their state agencies for specific coverage details. So what if you're uninsured? Well, free home tests can be obtained from certain community health centers or requested through the federal program online. A free call line will also be launched for people who don't have Internet access. 
and those who want a free at home test from the federal government. There will be a number that'll be coming out. We do not have that number right now. A launch date for that call line hasn't been provided yet. Several San Antonio area school districts announcing temporary closures because of staffing shortages. They come as the Omicron variant continues to spread through staff members in these districts. Comal ISD, Gonzalez ISD, they canceled classes for today, but they plan to resume tomorrow. However, Ingram ISD, Sabinal ISDs, they have extended their closures through tomorrow. Classes will resume on Thursday. Rungi, Medina, and Uvalde ISDs are all closed through Friday. They're expected to return to class next Monday, January 24th. And while those schools have had to temporarily close because of staffing shortages, schools in San Antonio haven't reached that point. But they are certainly looking for more substitute teachers. We reached out to the three largest districts in San Antonio to find out the requirements. For Northside ISD, you must have a valid teacher certificate or have completed at least 90 semester hours from an accredited college or university with a minimum 2.5 GPA. You must also be able to speak, read, and write English well enough to carry out the duties of a substitute teacher and must pass a, must pass a finger fingerprint background check. Now that comes with a non-refundable fee, which would be paid by the employee. In 2020, Northeast ISD changed its sub qualifications from requiring a bachelor's degree to requiring 60 college hours. A sub applicant must also identify a minimum of two professional references. One needs to be a current or former supervisor. Then in San Antonio ISD, you must have a high school diploma or GED. You must list a current or recent supervisor or college professor as a reference on your application, and you must also pass a background check. The pay rates do vary at each of these districts and based on how often you work or whether you're bilingual, you can find more information at each of the district's websites listed right there on your screen. It is the unofficial kickoff to the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo, and this year, the Cowboy Breakfast, it won't be open to the public once again. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, though. Organizers are going to cook and serve breakfast for San Antonio's first responders during private events. They expect to serve about 6,500 tacos, a drive-by style event for each precinct. Now, prior to the pandemic, the Cowboy Breakfast was held outside Cowboys Dance Hall. About 30,000 people would attend every year. I think we just made Adam Kasky hungry. <laughs> oh, that looks good. Hey, today, another beautiful day. 41 earlier this morning. That's exactly average for a morning low. And then 75 this afternoon. It's feeling relatively warm considering the average high is 63. Right now, Eagle Pass 75, just about 80 in Warren's backyard in Del Rio. But West Kerrville 72, 77 Panamaria. Maria. The widespread 70s, especially low to mid 70s this evening. Pretty straightforward. Just some nice high thin clouds, which should give us a nice sunset by 10 o'clock near 60 50s later tonight fog developing strong cold front and a light wintry mix to talk about and some chilly temperatures seen a bit thank you adam fighting 5g rollout's been a big topic in the airline industry and now something being done about it what two major cell phone companies have agreed to do and for how long that story next Let's take a look at stories our team is working on for the news at 6 o'clock today. Bridging the gap between a career in the military and one in science. Texas Biomedical Research Institute here in San Antonio is working with the Department of Defense to bring more service members into the field of science. Coming up at 6, we introduce you to a researcher who has been working on the development of COVID-19 vaccines after serving in the military. They'll talk about that transition. Plus, she was accused of stealing more than $150,000 from a property management company that she worked for. Then she faced accus accusations of stealing again while she was treasurer for a school district booster club. Today, she appeared in court. Dylan Collier with what the judge decided today at 6. And there have been some new developments in the airline fight against 5G to cell phone carriers agreeing to partially delay their 5G signal rollouts planned for tomorrow amid concern from airline officials. Top airline executives say the stronger wireless connection would cause mass cancellations and potential safety problems. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. 
With airline officials sounding the alarm, concerned about the threat of an aviation catastrophe, AT&T and Verizon now announcing they'll both delay the Wednesday rollout of their stronger 5G service near some airports. Top airline executives had been warning of mass cancellations for both cargo and passenger flights, plus potential safety issues with the new 5G signal, saying it could disrupt radio equipment needed for landing, especially in inclement weather. This is unsafe. The manufacturers have said so, our airlines are saying so, the FAA is saying so, and so are pilot unions. Other countries have successfully launched similar 5G signals, but the FAA says the 5G in America will be twice as powerful. ABC's Mary Bruce questioning the White House on why the FAA didn't act sooner with testing the signals. The agency aware of this rollout plan for two years now. Did the FAA drop the ball here? There'll be lots of time to look back and see how we got here. What we're focused on is uh, trying to come to a solution that will uh, minimize uh, disruptions uh, to passenger travel, cargo operations, and our economic recovery. And that is why it's so important to hopefully come to an agreement and ensure uh, more planes are flying. Executives from airlines, including American, Delta, United, and Southwest, are urging the government to keep the new 5G signals at least two miles away from U.S. airports. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Let's take a look outside with live cam. 73 degrees, enjoying the sunshine and this spring-like weather before winter comes roaring back. Yeah, while we can. <laughs> Oh, it's going to look and feel like winter in just a few days. Get ready for it. We've got one more warm day ahead of us. It's actually going to be warmer tomorrow than today. I think a good chunk of our area will just briefly hit 80 degrees, then cold and windy as we get into Thursday. And behind that cold front during the day Thursday, a light wintry mix is light likely. So let's start talking about temperatures, the cold front, how temperatures will react, and then we'll jump into that light wintry mix. I mean, you look at the temperature now, 74, dew point 47. Across the state, you're thinking, cold front? What cold front? We're well into the 70s, even Del Rio, 81 degrees. Oh, there's the cold front, my friends. You look off to the north into the Dakotas, even moving into Nebraska right now. That's the leading edge of the cold air. Pierce, South Dakota, 26, Minot. Why not Minot? Freezing's a reason. One below right now. International Falls at 21. So that cold air, it's headed our way, and we're going to feel it. Wednesday night and especially during the day Thursday. But you look at our readings right now and it's pleasant outside. It's comfortable, above average for this time of year, of course. Hondo 75, New Braunfels, and Gonzalez currently at 74. So widespread 70s. Tomorrow morning, we'll be in the low to mid 50s for morning temperatures. So 50 Hondo, about 48 Kerrville, 54 in San Antonio, and closer to 60 along the Gulf Coastline. So a mild start to the day tomorrow. By the afternoon, we get up right near 80 degrees, even Kerrville, Fredericksburg, about 78, Pleasanton, 80 degrees, Catula, 82, and we're thinking about 78 here in San Antonio. Then we get into Thursday, and we're down to 32 degrees in the afternoon. I think we'll start the day around 35. By the noon hour, we'll be right around the freezing point. So cold on your Thursday, and that sets the stage for a light wintry mix. We've got the temperatures in place, we need the moisture, we need the energy and the lift to get some clouds and precipitation going. And I think we'll get that here from this little disturbance, a weak little dip in the upper level flow there. You can see that on the wind contours over the Four Corners region and some precipitation associated with it already. That's the Thursday disturbance that's going to slide up and over the cold air. So let's talk about it with the future cast. Morning fog tomorrow, probably dense in some spots. So some reduced visibility and potential for a dense fog advisory in the morning. Sunny by tomorrow afternoon, cold front hits around 9 p.m., so in the evening, and behind it, temperatures plummet, winds pick up. We get into Thursday, we've got that upper energy. At sunrise in the morning, a few sprinkles, maybe brief little area of sleet. As we get into the midday and early afternoon, as we start to see more precipitation develop, we're likely to see areas of light freezing rain and sleet. Remember, freezing rain's the liquid that turns into ice right when it hits an elevated surface or the ground. And sleet is just a frozen raindrop, the loud ting, 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 ting on your windows and your windshield. And 
don't pay too close attention to the exact location and time on the future cast. That's still up in the air. I think all of us have about the same opportunity throughout the day, especially in the afternoon and evening. So light sleet and freezing rain, and we're talking minimal accumulations. But what we need to watch for is the icy glaze on bridges and overpasses and also windy and colder. I mean, we're talking temperatures near freezing winds gusting up to about 40 miles per hour. So tomorrow, nothing to worry about. Another sunny, warm afternoon up near 80 degrees, but it's going to feel like down near 20 on Thursday. Bridges and overpasses really the only concern right now with this just light wintry mix. One more day before that gets here. Oof. Yes. All right, so they played toe to toe with the best team in the NBA or one of them. Yep. Is there solace in that? No, not really, because the same old problem is wearing up, and it's that fourth quarter and giving up over 120 points on their defense. The defense right now, their biggest problem. When we come back, we're talking about what happened last night against the Phoenix Suns, the best team in the NBA, and Ezekiel Elliott revealing to us he played with a torn PCL. Coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs have now lost 10 of their last 12 games and only been able to win one game during this seven-game homestand after falling to the best team in the NBA, the Phoenix Suns, last night. Spurs are able to take the early lead in the first quarter when DeJounte Murray finds Keldon Johnson for the three. Welcome back, Jakob Pertl, who missed the Clippers game due to back issues, gets the floater to fall. Spurs are up by five. Now in the second quarter, the Spurs' Doug McDermott off the give-and-go hits from inside the arc for a 45-43 Spurs lead, but the Suns lead at the break 59-56. An even better third quarter for the Spurs, Derek White weaves his way through traffic hit the pull-up jumper the Spurs are out to a six-point lead Spurs get their largest lead of the game off the Devin Vassell miss but Jock Landale taps it back to Vassell gets a second try to go in and the Spurs lead 84-74 but then game the fourth quarter Jay Crowder strips the ball away from DeJounte Murray he gets it ahead to Chris Paul who then is able to find Devin Booker for the lay-in Booker was on fire he scored a season high 48 points the Suns outscored the Spurs 34-16 in the final quarter wind up winning 121 to 107. They're a very, very good team. Um, you know, they were in the championship last year. So they're a very good team, very solid. Um, you know, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot a couple of times. We had some bad turnovers, uh, some couple of bad shots. But, you know, we were we were right there, you know. And, uh, I mean, hats off to them. They played, a, they played a good game and, you know, they played solid. And uh, we just got to be better. All right, next up, Oklahoma City tomorrow night at 7.30. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. As we continue to dissect Dallas's dismal playoff performance, one aspect that comes under the microscope is the Cowboys' rushing attack or lack thereof. The San Francisco 49ers outgained the Cowboys on the ground, 169 yards to just 77, and the highest paid running back in the league, Ezekiel Elliott, just 31 yards on 12 carries. We knew he was playing with a bum knee for the last two months, but what we didn't know is that Zeke has a partially torn posterior cruciate ligament. It was hard. You know, it's never fun being banged up, um, but uh, it's my job uh, to make sure I get my body racking and, and be ready uh, for my team, uh, for the fan base, for the coaches. Uh, so, I mean, it's hard, but I mean, it's my job. Zeke says he will not need surgery. We'll wrap it up after this. All right, tomorrow warm, upper 70s near 80, morning fog, afternoon sunshine, light wintry mix, bridges and overpasses, the primary concern on Thursday. And it's going to be windy and cold, though, feeling like it's near 20. And then we'll have temperatures in the 20s Friday morning and Saturday morning. Thanks for watching the News at 5. See you back here at 6.